Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to Elm Street Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. I'm glad you have chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together and have fellowship. The house of God is such a special place to be. You may have heard people refer to a church congregation as the body of Christ. This is because the Bible explains that we are, each individual, a part of one whole body, the body of Christ. We're glad you've joined us. Um, please sign in on the comment section if you're watching us on Facebook. And if you have a prayer request or need to be contacted, please let us know there as well. And I have a few announcements today. Bible study. Tattoos on the heart, Monday, 6.30 to 8, but there will be no Bible study tomorrow, October 31st. The Lenten Bible study begins on November 27th. That's going to be from 6.45 to 8 via Zoom. So please let Pastor Kathy know if you're interested. Holiday Visions are out and about ministries. Um, we need volunteers to put together bags and to distribute those. And that is held the last Saturday in November, which is November 26th. So we'll be putting those together beforehand. We, Should... have, the, we have the stuff. It's in the closet. All we have to do is bring it up here. Okay. Do that. All right. Uh, Women's Fellowship. They have a program this Wednesday, November 2nd at 7 p.m., why Vinyl Records are back. The presenter will be Larry Day. The mission of the month for November is our annual Christmas baskets collection. And I know we usually have a sign up, so please be on the look up. Oh, it's already out there. There's already a sign up sheet out in the vestry. So please sign up um, on what you will be bringing. The Traveling Church, the next one will be held November 16th or November 23rd. They're both Wednesdays, sometimes during the day. If you're interested, please let Pastor Kathy know. And the last announcement, um, a celebration next Sunday at 2 in Fellowship Hall. Kim and Dave Kerboy will be celebrating Lisa's 40th birthday. So you are all welcome to attend next Sunday at 2. And she likes bling, right? She likes bling. She likes, she likes bling. bling. Any other announcements? Okay, we'll start with our morning prelude. Our call to worship. We have gathered today in search of reformation. We want to reform ourselves, our church, and our society. We stand fearless at the edge of change. For God is in the midst of us, and we shall not be moved. Be still, and know that God is God. God is our rock and our redeemer. You are our hiding place, O God. You preserve us from trouble and deliver us from death. You teach us your wisdom and show us your grace by honoring the weak and forgiving the wicked. All glory and praise be to you, for justice and mercy meet in you. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Please join me for the opening hymn, in the green hymnals, number 25, Immortal, Invisible, we'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 4.
so we're here for the next exciting adventure of Saul, first king of Israel. So the other nations around Israel had their own kings, and the king of the Amorite was very um, warlike. And he had gotten these two tribes by themselves. There were 12 originally, and he got these two tribes by themselves, and he had taken every man in the military and gouged out their right eye. And then he, he sent a message that he was going to do that to all the rest of the Israelites, and he, he encircled another group of them, and he said, you either sub submit to me and agree that I can take your right eye, or I'm going to kill you all. And they said, well, now, wait a minute. Give us a week, and let us get our stuff together, and then if we can't come up with something else, we'll let you do it, basically. So they sent out messengers. And Saul, who's this new king, heard of this. And he's like, what in the world is happening? And this was called the charisma of God. So the charisma of God falls upon Saul, and he becomes this incredible leader. And he gets all of the people from the rest of the tribes of Israel together. And um, he, he's kind of sneaky. He cuts his oxen up in little pieces and sends them out to all the tribes. And he says, if you don't come out and fight with us, this is what's going to happen to your oxen. So I guess that was a big incentive because they all turned out. And there was this huge battle and the Amorites got beaten and scattered. And this was Saul's first military victory that gives him this boost of, you know, they said he was king, they anointed him king, but now he has the charisma of God and he has done a kingly thing. And so now he is that first king of Israel. So Samuel is still the chief priest. Samuel still goes with him. So it's Samuel and, or Samuel still the judge. He still goes with him. So it's Samuel and Saul. But soon Samuel will retire and we will just have Saul. And we'll see what happens to this first king who has the charisma of God. We'll have to do that next week, same bat channel, same bat place. Our call to confession. When we keep our mistakes and misdeeds hidden away, we are consumed with guilt and pain. Therefore, let us come into the light and acknowledge our shortcomings, trusting that God will forgive us and make us whole. Please join me in the confession prayer. Loving God, you promise that all who faithfully confess to you will be forgiven and preserved from trouble. Trusting in your mercy, we acknowledge the harm that we have done and the good we have failed to do. Forgive us, we pray. Guide us in your truth and teach us the way to go that we may love and serve you well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hear the good news. Though our sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. For the Lord has promised to forgive all and to surround with steadfast love everyone who trusts in God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In sharing ourselves, we reflect God's vision of love and justice for the world. Let us give freely so that the ministry of Jesus Christ may flourish in this community and beyond. We'll collect our morning offering now.
Please join me in the prayer of dedication and thanksgiving. Holy, Holy One, one we, we ask, ask you to bless, to bless these, these tithes and offerings, offerings that, our that our gifts, gifts may embody your vision of the kingdom, kingdom and bless those who are vulnerable, oppressed, and seeking justice. In, In Jesus' name, name amen. amen. The scripture this morning is from Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacharias. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Please join me for the Gloria Patri. God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, open us to your word that we would hear what you would say to us today through Jesus Christ who invites us to welcome him in even before we are, are ready or worthy. Amen. Our sermon is, is Oh How He Loves You and Me, and I think we sing it through twice. It's 513. It's two verses, okay. may be seated. So it seems we just cannot get enough stories about tax collectors. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. 
But last week we had Zach, uh, the tax collector and uh, the Pharisee, where the tax collector uh, was just a generic tax collector. It was a parable that Jesus was giving. And uh, remember, the tax collector is in the temple uh, with his head bowed, and he's pounding on his chest, and he's saying, Lord, have mercy on me, right? Whereas the Pharisee has his hands open, and he's looking up God, and he says, thank God I'm not like that tax collector. Remember that? I'm not like him, man. I, I give to the poor. I, I do my prayers. I'm, I'm just, I'm wonderful. So thank God I'm not like, you know, that guy over there. And today, we have a specific taxpayer, and we have Pharisees again. So apparently, we are never going to run out of things that Pharisees and taxpayers or tax collectors have uh, in, in this time period. So what we are looking at today is a specific chief tax collector. Now, he's the one that would have the um, franchise from the Roman government to collect the taxes from a particular area. And then he would hire other people to go pick it up, which is probably what the other tax collector was last week. And this story about Zacchaeus, um, he is supposed to be a little dude who's very wealthy, extremely wealthy, ill-gotten gains wealthy, Bill Gates wealthy, Wealthy, wealthy. I should say Elon Musk, wealthy. Um, or Jeff Boaz, wealthy, but wealthy. And yet he seeks to see Jesus. And you got to wonder what's up with that. Right, because he knows Jesus, here Jesus is coming. There's a whole crowd coming. He's a short guy, big crowd, can't see a thing, and he's tired of looking at people's elbows. And so he runs in front of the crowd, and he gets to the sycamore tree, and he climbs up the sycamore tree so that he can see Jesus. Now he has no idea that Jesus is going to see him too. No idea that Jesus is going to talk to him. Because all his desire is, is just to see Jesus, and we don't know why. But here comes Jesus, and he looks up in that tree, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree, because I'm going to your house for dinner. Well, there's Jesus, he's just inviting himself to dinner. And here are the Pharisees, like they have been during all of Luke, as they're going... Jesus doesn't get it. He's always eaten with the wrong people. Every time we turn around, sinners, prostitutes, does he not understand that he needs to be with the righteous people? Does he not get that? And so they're always irritated that he is hanging out with the wrong kind of people. It's going to ruin his reputation. But that's what Jesus does. He ruins people's reputation by going where righteous people won't go. Now, why does he do that? Well, I'm going to suggest that he does that because at the heart of God is generosity. In fact, Luke, Luke's idea of what, what's happening in Luke is specifically stated tons of times that Jesus has come to save the lost. So who are the lost? Well, Luke is writing to a group of people who, <clears throat> excuse me, about 90 CE, temple's been destroyed. Jesus has been dead for six years. And he's writing to a group of what we think are Gentiles. So he's making the case that God's love is extravagant and covers everybody. So if, if the Pharisees 
or the Jewish upper echelons were hearing this story, they would think that the sinner was Zacchaeus, chief tax collector, obviously. He's the bad guy. But when we read it, and maybe when the people from the Lucan community read it or heard it, they might have thought, well, both of them have a long ways to go. Because when the Pharisees say, you're hanging out with the wrong people, they're making a judgment about God's love. That God can only love righteous people. And for a Pharisee, a righteous person is one who follows the rules. Not just the rules in Torah, but all the extra rules that are created around Torah to keep Torah safe. Um, so I heard the story one time about this goldfish bowl. There are some goldfish in a goldfish bowl, but there were rules in the goldfish tank. And somebody had taken a, a black permanent magic marker and written all the rules for the goldfish to follow and for the person who was taking care of the goldfish to follow, so much so that you could no longer see the goldfish. Couldn't see them and they couldn't see you. You were separated by laws, by rules. And then came this person with a bottle of Windex and a rag and they took off all of those laws and simply wrote the word love. So that the person caring for the goldfish would know that you need to love your goldfish and the goldfish would know that you need to love your people or your, your carer. Just one word. And it's the generosity of this word that pulls us to God. I know that we have talked in here about that uh, Bart, a theologian from the middle of the 20th century, did not feel that we could seek out God, but that God had to seek us out, and that the best we could do was be open to his seeking out. Now, I, I really don't know if that's true, but that was his thought, and he's a theologian, and I'm not. I'm just a pastor. But if that is true, and if we're leaving ourselves open to God's love, then like Zacchaeus, we are ready to respond when Jesus says, I'm coming to your house for dinner. We are ready because we have prepared ourselves, climbed up a tree to see Jesus. And we may be surprised when Jesus calls our name. We may be surprised when that love shows up in our lap and we're like, oh, I didn't expect that. So I think the heart of this story is the extravagant, generous love of God. Now, if we look at the Gospel of John, we know that Jesus himself is the love of God who becomes incarnate and human. And it's this love that goes around the Middle East doing things that he ought not be doing. He's feeding people. He's talking to people that are irredeemably lost. He's not spending time with the right folk. He's not making the right connections. He's not building his resume. He's just every day giving people what they need to be whole. And I think that's what Jesus does for us. All of us have broken lives. We have been hurt. We have lost. We have loved. We have had disappointments. We look around the world and sometimes we fear what is happening in our, in our, in our world. 
climate control is a big idea. I don't know how to deal with that. Too much garbage. I don't know how to, I don't know how to deal with any of that. It's just too big. But there is God with his generosity of love. There is God saying, you are not alone. You have me. You have your brothers and sisters. God keeps us together in community and forms this oasis, this uh, um, outpost of the kingdom of God, so that we might be together, so that we might theologically and socially knit ourselves together as a community, so that we are ready to help when God calls us to work. And God will call us to work. He does already. And we can do that with open hearts and open minds because we have been prepared for that. It's not something that's a trick. God is calling us. We're preparing. So a church has got three things, right? A church is the place where we learn about God. It's called theology. And really, it's learning about how God works in the world because we can't actually study God. He won't sit still. Uh, church is a social. We are together socially so that we can love one another and support one another and laugh with one another and cry with one another and be together as a family. Church is a family. And the other one is mission. We are on a mission to spread that love that generosity of love that God has for the world. And it's up to us, right? We're the hands, we're the feet, we're the heart, we're the eyes that Jesus has on earth right now. And so that's the mission section. Now I have to say, we're doing pretty good. I think we are doing pretty good with all of those. We can always do better. But I do like that we spend time after church together that we talk to each other during the week, that we're texting, that we are seeking out the advice of older and wiser folk, that we are uh, communicating with younger folk, and that we get together and just have lunch or do coffee or something like that too. And then we do the mission in the traveling church is one of the things that we really need to continue to do. I'd like to do it twice in November because we have several homebound folk that really need us to come and bring church to them. So everything we do, everything we do is about this generosity that God has. Now, we're going to start our stewardship campaign. And I would like you to think about it as a way to embody that generosity. That we are an outpost, and small in number we may be, let us not be small in our generosity. And that's not just the money aspect, although that is important, and somebody needs to say, we have to keep the lights on and the heater on and we have to repair the building and we've got expenses and that is just true. And ministry costs money. And we are responsible for that. So as we go into uh, our, our um, stewardship campaign, Consider the generosity of the love of God and your contribution in all kinds. And I know that uh, the stewardship team has a theme. It's bread and wine. It's bread and wine. It connects the table to our mission. Because in everything we do, we are at a sacred table. So that when we support our church, it's a sacred act. It is something that we are called to do. 
So let us remember that in the coming weeks as we prepare for that. Would you pray with me? Holy God, our Father and our Mother, we thank you for the things that you've given us and for the things that you have taken away. We pray for all who have lost and all who are mourning. We pray that your word might grow in our hearts and that you might stir us to new greatness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we now have our joys and concerns. Caitlin. Okay. Okay. Jeff. Wait, she just died of kidney failure. Wow, yesterday. Okay. Is she, is she in the hospital or is she at home? Do you know if she's in the hospital or is she at home? Okay. Okay, I'll check with that later. Anything else? Norm. All right, what's your not so good news? Nice. That's great. Yes, that's good. Do we have another? Okay. Holy God, we love for you to keep these things in front of you so that you might um, unburden our hearts and with the generosity of your love, help us through these darker times. We pray for Matt to get an apartment and for Caitlin to get a job. For Jean Arsenault's niece or grandniece who died from kidney disease or kidney failure. And for our own dear Lynn Partlow, who has a blood clot in her um, 
in her chest and we pray for her um, healing. We um, sympathize with Norman being in a traffic jam that takes you for hours to get through. And we are glad, Lord, that you worked things out so that he would have better care instead of worse. And these things we lay before you, dear Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. God of love and justice, you have made it clear to us that you tire of our churchy words and religious festivals, and that the worship you want from us is an ethical life lived out in a society that we make just. Hear our prayers for your whole creation, saying, please join me, save your world. We pray for the church and for all who live by faith, doing charity and advocating for social change. God of justice, save your world. Cultivate peace between nations, between people, and between political parties. God of justice, save your world. Protect and comfort those enduring the violence of war or crime or the destructive forces of nature. God of justice, save your world. Preserve those who suffer violence at home and bullying at school and embolden those who see their trouble to help bring relief and help. God of justice, save your world. Grant your healing mercies to those who are ill or facing death and uphold those who care for them. God of justice, save your world. Delivering God through Jesus Christ, you come to us and teach us the way of true worship, doing good, seeking justice, rescuing the oppressed, defending the orphan, and pleading for the widow. Renew in us your vision of the worship that you want, that we may take part in your work in the world by the power of your strengthening spirit. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. Our closing hymn is in the green hymnal, number 309, Pass It On.
good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow, trusting in the power of God to do all things. And now may the deliverance of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit go with us all and give us peace. Let us do our threefold amen. <laughs>